welcome to our dad on the Jim Cressman podcast. Welcome to the Jim Cressman podcast. On the podcast today, we have Stuart Chatwood, born in England, raised in Windsor, Ontario. He's a founding member of the Tea Party, a band that sold over 3 million albums worldwide, toured the entire world, still holds the distinction of being the first Canadian band to perform on the main stage at Lollapalooza, and they are getting ready to drop a brand new EP called Sun Shower. Welcome to the podcast, Stuart. It's uh, great to finally meet you. So awesome. Good to meet you too. So first question I wanted to ask you, growing up in Windsor, and I know that, that the rest of the members are from that city as well, did the geographic proximity of Detroit affect the genesis of the sound of the Tea Party as you guys were developing um, your very proprietary sound, which went on to, of course, be renowned around the world. Absolutely. I mean, if you were in England and you lived in Oxford, you'd probably be influenced by the university there. But Detroit, back in the late 70s, had four massive rock and roll stations like W4, uh and riff or maybe two of the most famous ones uh like howard stern i think started at mm-hmm. w4 but by the age of 12 we all had an encyclopedic knowledge of all the 500 songs of rock radio and we knew them inside and out and uh that allowed us in high school because you kind of want to change in high school you don't want to stick to the stuff you're listening to in grade six grade seven whatever uh, it allowed us to explore post-punk and punk music and new wave stuff from England, uh, the Cure, Echo and the Bunnymen, that sort of stuff, because we'd already been educated in Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, et cetera. But at, at the end of high school, and we're at this stage, we're better musicians. It enabled us to go back to rock music and dig deep into like the deep Jimi Hendrix cuts and, you know, put on Led Zeppelin's presence and, you know, the B-side. And it's like, okay, why are these songs important to Led Zeppelin's catalog and their canon? instead of just a whole lot of loves, you know, for example. So uh, it, it really rounded off our education, just knowing, you know, performers like Iggy Pop. I mean, so many musicians have copied Iggy Pop. I mean, Iggy Pop is classically infamous because people might not know who Iggy Pop is, but if you show him on stage and then show a modern singer performing like Iggy Pop, you'd be like, ah, now I get it. Now I know why Anthony Kiedis does that. Okay, Iggy Pop did that in the early 70s, so... It all kind of makes sense. Um, and then Alice Cooper, you know, it, it's in the DNA in Detroit. I mean, there's a reason Kiss records, you know, all their live records there and Detroit Rock City, you know, um, it's known around the world. You know, they make cars and they make rock and roll music. So definitely made it into uh, its way into our DNA. I love that you talked about the B-sides, too. I think one of the downsides of our industry migrating to more of a, a singles driven world is that we've lost the depth of an overall uh, album composition mm-hmm. and and the analysis and the well-roundedness that comes with that. Yeah. I mean, on we always tried to have an epic song on our records, like a seven minute thing. When we recorded Edges of Twilight in Los Angeles with Ed Stasium, who did the Ramones and Living Color, um, Living Color, the rock band, not the comedy show, but uh, <laughs> it was still analog in 1994, December 94. And, uh, we had to get three tape machines synced up because we were into like 60 channels of audio uh, throughout that entire song. There was timpani, there was world music instruments, there was everything. But we took it on as a challenge and that was always the centerpiece of our records. And then we'd go off on tangents and divergent you know, directions musically. Um, but you know, a song like that, to try and get that on radio, give me a break. It would need to be chopped up and destroyed. Uh, fortunately, much music was still a thing and we made this beautiful video in sepia tone with a uh, Curtis Wayfritz directing. He won an award for it. Um, so luckily it's still, I mean, we still had to edit the song down, but you know, not too much that it was, was ruined, but uh, you know, luckily there was that outlet for people to hear that song and it, it's still a staple of our live show. But uh, another funny thing, actually at that session in 94, uh, we had a track with this English musician, Roy Harper, and uh, he played with uh, 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 Pink Floyd and he plays with Jimmy Page quite a bit. And uh, he was kind of like the the English version of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the first guy who signed to Apple Records. Was it James, uh, the folk singer from America? Um, Not James Taylor. Yeah, James Taylor, I think it was. Was it? Mm-hmm. Was he on Apple Records? It was either I believe him. so. Yeah. Okay. So James Taylor or Roy Harper were going to be the first folk signing to Apple, but they chose James Taylor. 
Uh, we might be wrong on that, so <laughs> we'll be on Wikipedia after this. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so yeah. we were recording a song for Roy Harper, who had, we, we had toured with, and in the studio right next to us was another senior guy recording with a young band, and it was Neil Young with Pearl Jam. So we, we would go to like the cafeteria and make ourselves an espresso, and Neil Young was in there, and at the time he was obsessed with analog gear. Everything had to be analog. Digital was bullshit and it sucks. And at the time, I kind of agreed. The digital technology at the time wasn't mature enough to he make great records. But he heard us working on the Mellotron on one of our tracks. He's like, I hear you got some good Mellotron going on in there. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that the A&M Studios Mellotron had some faulty keys. And the Mellotron's this machine that has tape loops. So when you press like an important key, like the A key, you know, it'd be like, you know, <laughs> So it was unusable in the track. So we had to go out and actually get a digital unit. But I didn't have the heart to tell Neil Young. So <laughs> Yeah, he would consider that uh, sacrilege so, absolutely. at the time. Yeah. yeah. So back to the beginnings a little bit with this band. All three of you grew up in Windsor. And, and we were talking a little bit off air before the podcast started rolling that um, you were sort of a, a latecomer to the Tea Party. Yeah. Jeff and Jeff. Two Jeffs. Yeah. yeah. They went to grade school together and they had their first band at age nine and 10. And they would do these uh, high or elementary school uh, assemblies at Christmas time. And, you know, Jeff's voice hadn't sunk yet, you know, because of puberty. So he was singing yesterday up here. It was like, yesterday, all my troubles. <laughs> but the crowd was going bananas. It was like, you know, the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. So, uh, come high school, that's when we started our relationship and we met. And, uh, he said to me, uh, you're cool. I want someone cool in my new band. And I'm like, I don't know how to play guitar, dude. But, and, but he said, you know, I know you go to England each year and you get some new clothes and some cool music, but you're just what my band needs. And he broke the news, Jeff Burrows, and Jeff Burrows seemed cool with it. So, uh, you know, I got my first proper guitar. Uh, interestingly enough, though, I did have a guitar at age 10, but it was one of these cheap Kmart ones that, you know, mm -hmm. had horrible action. And unless you had the grip of, you know, King Kong, you weren't going to play that thing at all. So, so I guess it was a dream that was in my back, the back of my mind at some point. And, uh, I, I had a to-do list actually. I remember like one of these goal lists of, you know, win a Grammy, play a stadium, you know, meet the Rolling Stones, all these sorts of things. And, uh, so it was definitely in the cards for me to do this. I think. What age so. did you have that list? Uh, like age 11, you know, somewhere around there. I mean, it's okay, part of the so idea. I wanted the guitar, you know, that whole idea of the, the school assembly and getting the adoration of your classmates and all that. Yeah. That, that's something that's appealing, I think, to a lot of kids at that age. Rockstar aspirations at an early age. Yeah, definitely. And it, so, it's cool, though. That list got checked off. You know, it was like, OK, I got a platinum record now. And, you know, I met the Rolling Stones and I played a stadium many times and you know, we played that giant concert in Toronto to 500,000 people. So yes. it's like, you know, I went beyond, you know, I couldn't have imagined playing in front of that many people ever. So, But you must have known at an early age that you had artistic inc inclinations. I mean, you've gone on to design Juno award winning artwork for the band. You uh, have composed uh, successful soundtracks for multiple video game entities. There must have been a part of you very early on, obviously, that knew that you had a predisposition for being an artist. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of a jack of all trades type person. And I think the full quote is like, jack of all trades, master of none. Better be that than the master of just one or something like that. It's words to that effect anyway. But mm -hmm. I've always pursued that. I just wanted to stay interested in the things I was doing and the idea I think I saw Leona Boyd talking about classical guitar and she was like, if you want to be good at this, you've got to only do this because there's other people in the world only doing this. And if you're not doing this 12 hours a day, you know, you're not going to make it. And that kind of put me off a little bit. I was like, you know what? Maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I do want to bring my knowledge of art and music together and explore different ways. Um, I, I, I was recently diagnosed with ADHD and, uh, just that, that coincides with the way my mind's been working my whole life. I'm able to pull these things together that might not seem related and I can find that connection. So it comes in handy when you're writing a song and, you know, you need a bridge and, you know, Jeff Burroughs, Jeff Martin, they've written this riff together and like we've, we've come to a, a standstill and we don't know what to do. And I can just keep throwing melodies at them based on what they have, you know, so we've got a good, good chemistry in the band. But um, the soundtrack stuff, that came later in 1996. We recorded an EP in Montreal at Studio Morin Heights, the famous studio that Rush recorded all the records at. And the engineer there, he uh, he and myself were chatting about, you know, soundtrack work and, you know, I'd, how I'd love to get into, you know, scoring video games. And 
three years later, he quit and went to work at Ubisoft on the Prince of Persia and just called me out of nowhere. And he said, would you like to score the music for this exotic video game with a lot of Middle Eastern music and Indian music? And I said, sure, uh, let me know when you want me to start. So I didn't hear anything for two years. And then the, the guy calls me, Simon, great guy, calls me mm -hmm. in two years and he's like, okay, we're ready for you to pitch. I'm like, huh? Pitch? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, you're going against 10 of the greatest composers in Hollywood. And I'm like, holy shit, I don't know what I'm doing here. So I had to learn really quick. And I think the authenticity that I could bring to the table with playing with the Tea Party and playing all those instruments really impressed the Ubisoft people because, you know, it was around a table of like 10 people that they listened to all the tracks and they picked me. And, you know, I went on to make seven different games for them uh, for the Prince of Persia series. And my latest one is Darkest Dungeon for a, a small video game company in Vancouver called Red Hook. And um, it's just got the greatest following. And I've got a horseshoe up my ass because both series of these two uh, franchises have been tremendously successful. So. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said for an associated uh, a benefit uh, to something that's deemed obviously or society-wide as, as a weakness with ADHD. Like often we label people with ADHD and we consider it an, an affliction. But if you can execute with ADHD, you can actually multitask very effectively. And as you've proven throughout your career, you can entertain many interests and passions all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. Unfortunately, we thrive on the deadline and <laughs> finishing things in that last hour. So uh, we tend to delay things, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, and that, that can cause a little stress, a little procrastination yeah. <laughs> causes stress. But yeah. uh, if you're able to execute and get things done, it's amazing what uh, people who have that affliction um, yeah. can actually accomplish. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So. So you guys, you guys had an amazing run, and it continues today. But you know, 1997 was a was a big turning point for the band mm -hmm. uh, with the album Transmission and Temptation, the the big rock single. And then a couple of years after that, you had a massive number one with Heaven Coming Down. Um, what was it like going from, you know, you've got this little band, and you've you've joined with your buddies, and uh, you guys are all pretty young. And you start to refine your sound. You start to really pursue how you want to be presented. And then all of a sudden you have this explosion of attention. Um, how did you guys manage that? Because you were all still relatively young. Yeah. I mean, we thought we'd be successful. That's why we started the band. And, you know, like we got great reactions in these small clubs that we we're playing. And we always thought we should be playing better, more comfortable venues where we can spread out and have proper sound and all that. So. Getting to a certain level was, you know, kind of expected and we were prepared for it. But then, like, as you say, in 97, things took off. And all of a sudden, you know, one year, the following year, 1998, we headlined Edgefest across Canada playing stadiums and uh, playing before us was Green Day and the Foo Fighters. So, I mean, we weren't really ready for that, perhaps. Uh, there's a bit of a learning curve. I mean, Dave Grohl, that guy can control a stadium now. Uh, but he, even he himself, you know, he was a different performer back then in 98. Yes. But, uh, so it's definitely a skill to play to a room that size. But man, when you go back to a slightly smaller, like if you played a tour of stadiums, then you go back to a small theater of 1500, you feel like Kings because <laughs> the stage is so small compared to that giant stadium stage. And you just feel everyone's listening and you can really communicate, which is a powerful feeling uh, to be on stage and be able to communicate emotion uh, to, to the crowd. Without being um, presumptuous, it sounds like that might be your preference to perform to a smaller, more engaged audience than a larger, more distracted one. Yeah. I mean, um, I've seen a lot of shows at like the 5,000 gigantic theater. I feel that is too big. I feel like a two and a half thousand seat theater might be the perfect venue. Uh, you can just get, I mean, as long as the crowd is allowed to stand up and enjoy the show properly, you know, there's nothing worse than playing Montreal. And the whole crowd, they want to go bananas, but <laughs> it's almost like they're duct taped to their seats, you know. Um, so it's nice to have a room that size for proper sound and lights and uh, everyone to hear th everything. But, uh, yeah, hopefully they can enjoy the show the way they want to enjoy it. So you guys had aspirations for success from the very beginning. Like you said, that's one of the reasons why you, you joined a band. You started developing this project. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, things take off and... Was it difficult for you to manage that sudden level of fame, even though you had an expectation that at some point you would achieve that? 
Uh, did it change the dynamics within the band at all? I know you guys are pretty tight and have been for years and you have been up to that point, but did it, uh, did it challenge you in, in ways that you feel could, um, in a way that you could talk about that actually might help a young developing band who might be tuning into this podcast and going, you know what, these are some things that we better be paying attention to in terms of band dynamics if things explode and we start getting yeah. a lot of attention rapidly. I think what kept us together is we were brothers, uh, not brothers, uh, you know, uh, literally, but figuratively. And um, with that comes forgiveness and a bit of leeway. We also didn't mm -hmm. hang out together socially all the time. So <laughs> like sometimes you come off the road and, you know, Jeff Martin in Montreal was living down the street from me, but it was like, uh, no, I don't want to go out with you every night. You know, <laughs> I've got my own set of friends here in Montreal. Um, and, you know, egos get out of control. And if you don't have that forgiveness and that leeway there, uh, then the bands will break up and it broke us up. You know, we broke up in 2005 for six years. And then we got back together and we realized what a special thing we had, you know, um, when we got back together, there were grown men crying in the front row saying, I never thought I'd ever get a chance to see you. This is awesome. Aww. You know, and it shifts at that point too. It's like all of a sudden it's the fans band as much or perhaps more than your band at that point. And you're not obligated to perform, but it's just like the magic really happens, you know, at that point, you know, and you, as you get older, you become gracious for it too. Uh, as you're on that roller coaster ride going up, um, you take a lot of things for granted. I mean, we had been warned by a lot of wise people in the industry not to burn any bridges, but inevitably, you know, people read you the wrong way and, you know, you leave a town and uh, people might think you were, you know, assholes or whatever, but, you know, you might have just not got any sleep on the bus that night, you know? So I'm very forgiving when people are like, oh, that guy was an asshole from that band or whatever. I'm like, you might not know the whole story there. And you as a promoter, you know that, right? You can <laughs> people well, come been, through town. I've been forewarned so many times. Um, and, and I don't even mind dropping names because I've I've had so much success and, and luck with these guys. But you know, people told me, Oh, Dwight Yoakum, he's so difficult. You know, you don't want to you don't want to work with that guy. And mm -hmm. I've done uh 26 dates on Dwight Yoakum, and he's been nothing but the most fair, kind, considerate, thoughtful person. Um, I heard the same things about John Mellencamp. I've had nothing but great shows and tours with John Mellencamp. He's always been uh, really fair, really mm -hmm. reasonable. Uh, it's really important to develop your own narrative around people and not just take, uh, you know, whatever you hear on the street about them. And, and I agree with what you said, like empathy and humanity. I mean, those, those are sort of the keys to us evolving as a species. And if we can find it, find the space within ourselves to forgive people for their trespasses and figure out how to get over things, not mm -hmm. only does it, does it make, does it enrich our relationships, but it helps us manage our own egos. And, and we can see the, sometimes we can see the idiosyncrasies in other people that we really should be seeing and tackling in ourselves much oh, easier. Right. Yep. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's it's just interesting because this business is so political and you're right. You never get a chance to make a first impression ever again. And so if things don't go right at a radio station or with a much yeah. music interview, all of a sudden <laughs> people are like, Coco's an asshole. And it's like, well, you know what? He hasn't slept in three days. Yeah. Like, that's just the reality. So did you did you encounter any of that where you felt like you didn't get a fair shake on a first impression. Um, in well, the in the States, it was tough for us in the States because we were on the same label as Stone Temple Pilots, Atlantic Records. And, um, you know, our record came out transmission the same week there did. So the guys going in the station from Atlantic saying, all right, I want you to play a song. And they're like, we're not playing anything this week. You know, and like, please. OK, I'll give your one album uh, one spin or whatever. And it's like, it's going to be Stone Temple Pilots. It's not going to be a tea party. But we had pockets of support throughout the U.S., like San Antonio, Texas. You know, we'd play a theater there for 1,500, and then we'd drive to Dallas and play for 200, you know. Seattle, same thing, you know, a couple of thousand people. Then Portland, you know, 200 people. Um, Rochester, New York, though. So Buffalo, we did great, huge numbers, multiple nights. And we'd drive to Buffalo, or Rochester, just down the road. And there was a radio guy in the morning, the big radio guy, and he loved our band. And he's like, I'm going to break you in Rochester bigger than Buffalo. So we booked the morning interview. And he was sick that day. So we came in there and this guy loved all the world music stuff. So I brought in this Indian harmonium and Jeff brought this uh, Sarad and we played it on the radio and they had their gag guy go in another room and call the radio station and pretend he was from Hell's Angels. 
and you know tell the dj what's it that world music bullshit you know i'm gonna come down there and kick your asses right now and we're just like huh what's this all about <laughs> and this is us getting off the tour bus like you said no sleep yeah and uh you and know it's not hard not show. to react to that you know so yeah but uh and then that ruins your relationship with that station in, in rochester when you barge out of the studio and call them fucking assholes <laughs> so yeah, Sorry. fair enough. Beep, beep, beep. Fair enough. <laughs> you can see that on both sides of it. But um, yeah. you guys also had really uh, massive success in Australia. I mean, that was another uh, part of the world where your music just seemed to really break down barriers and break through and, and really impact audiences. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think Australians, they have really, they have, I, it's going to sound funny to say this, but they have good taste in music. You know, like Jeff Buckley who's this amazing artist, he went to number one in Australia. Nobody knows who Jeff Buckley is. If you went to a random person, most musicians and critics know who he is for sure. But um, that's just an example. And I have, you know, Bjork and all these really creative people went to number one in Australia. Um, so there's a system there that doesn't copycat America and they're not beholden to what American stations are played. You know, there's some payola going on in America and we shouldn't be replicating that by playing, you know, a garbage song that got on the radio because someone gave somebody a, a bag of drugs or some money. Mm -hmm. But Australia is where we went in 1993, Christmas time, right after a tour of Canada and the first foreign territory proper for us because we'd done shows in the States at that point. But um, we arrived and the, the national radio station was playing one of our songs. And right off the bat, we did this residency in Sydney, you know, every second night we'd be doing a gig there, you know, but super cheap cover. And we watched our following grow from hardly anybody. When we left two weeks later, we sold out, you know, six or 700 seats at a firm ticket price on a Monday night. So, and when we returned like six months later and it was like all of a sudden into theaters. So it was a that's really a real hard ticket. When you can sell out a theater on a Monday night, that's a real hard ticket. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was a really organic growth and uh, we shot our video down there. So there was a lot of love shown and, you know, Jeff Martin lives down there, you know, what better mm -hmm. testament to, you know, the, the relationship between the band and that country. Um, unfortunately, after that, we tried to replicate it in Germany, but the tickets couldn't be cheap. They had to be like, you know, 20 euros or whatever. So people weren't able to, you know, come one week and then return the following week with like eight friends, you know, it just Too didn't much grow. Too much of a barrier to entry. Yeah. So yeah. in Australia, our peak was, you know, we did like massive festivals there and playing. I think we headlined a second stage to 8,000 at one of the big festivals. Uh, but uh, our own shows, we did like a Horden Pavilion to five and a half thousand people there. In Germany, perhaps our biggest shows, uh, solo shows, maybe like a thousand, twelve hundred people. So quite a, a difference there. But um, we're so thankful and we still have a great following down there. And, you know, we played with orchestras in Australia and, you know, just I don't have a bad thing to say about the country. At the time, I used to tell everyone it's the country that forgot to get rude, you know, because people back then were still polite and, you know, uh, it's just different. So, Yeah, you guys uh, came along in an era <clears throat> and it's always been critical to put in your 10,000 hours of live, but where you could really do that and watch the organic growth uh, almost concurrently with the amount of times that you would perform in a marketplace and Mm -hmm. Now, when I look at technology and how it's affected things and people breaking on TikTok, I mean, I'm not one of these guys who's who's, uh, you know, doom and gloom about the music industry. I think that, that the technology and the eyeballs just shift and mm -hmm. consumption just shifts. And that's just the way it is. And some of it's cyclical. But but you guys came along at a time when you could, you know, do exactly what you talked about there in city, like roll in there, cheap ticket perform, 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 build up your reputation as a great band. People would come back and see you pay a proper ticket price. And there seems to be less and less of that on the developmental landscape for artists these days. What mm -hmm. do you think will be the effect of that on our industry in the next five to 10 years? Well, I think that door kind of closed maybe 2005-ish, somewhere around there where, you know, uh, music television definitely helped us. And that, you know, I think of a band like Billy Talent. They might be, mm -hmm. you know, maybe one of the last bands through. Um, I mean, the Arkells, they had a great live show. And, you know, I think that helped them break a lot. But uh, I think the barrier to entry now is much lower. So you can get your signal and your song out there. And if it's good, I mean, and this is what I tell many people, you know, you can buy a certain level of success, but to have true success, you know, like an Adele or something like that, you need 
your disciples. You know, Adele mm-hmm. probably didn't have to hire a PR company. She probably could have just said, I'm releasing a new record. And then her disciples would have spread it. You know, everyone was talking about Adele there back a few weeks ago. And just nobody gets that mind share anymore. No one, you know. Um, I was talking to my wife about Feist, you know, how she was huge in, you know, the early 2000s. And she's still making music, but just it doesn't garner, you know, the attention anymore uh, that it once did because the world is so divergent now. And there's so many different interests and so many different mediums, you know. I mean, luckily, yeah. For her, she really broke through with the licensing deal for that Apple commercial. You know, like yeah, that, on a big that scale. That really, that really helped her on a big scale. But you're right. Now, same thing can happen. I mean, obviously, to a different level of scale. But you know, you can break on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, even. You know, and it's 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 fragmented the star system drastically in our mm-hmm. business. Yeah, I mean, music just isn't unfortunately as important as it once was. And I, I sound like an old fogey saying that I know, but <laughs> just, I mean, I know for my kids, they want to watch YouTube and they want to play video games and then they'll listen to some music as well. They love music, but uh, just, it's not, you know, back in the seventies, eighties, you know, you'd buy a record. It was so expensive. You bought it and you played it till it wore out and you stared at the album jacket forever and you got into a band and, you know, just that level of uh, interest just isn't there, you know? Well, there was a commitment. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're right. You had to save up. You had to get down to the record store and buy that album before anybody else got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the almost cathartic experience of unwrapping it, going through the artwork, uh, the lyric sheets, you know, all of that is just something that's completely lost now on, mm-hmm. you know, modern generations. And it's a little heartbreaking. Like for me, I've got I've got daughters seven and nine years old and they're they're they just they don't consume by the album unless they're stuck in the car with dad for a long yeah. road trip. <laughs> like they're not, they're not consuming it that way. They're consuming these snippets of it on TikTok or on YouTube or, or you're right. There's so many other uh, entertainment opportunities available to them. So uh, again, I don't want to sound like an old fogey <laughs> either because it's one of those things where it's like, well, is it good, bad, indifferent? I guess we'll see in 10 years, you know, yeah. like I'm not sure it's a bad thing, but it is what it is for now, and and uh, getting upset by it isn't going to change it. It's just how consumption seems to be. But yep. yeah, it'll be interesting to see if it if it affects the upper end of the star system. Like, will there be stadium acts in twenty five years to replace the ones that are dying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, um, like, who, there is a duality right now, though. I mean, if you looked at all the entertainment shows and magazines, what you would be convinced that you know uh, Kanye West and you know hip hop trip trap music whatever is ruling the world but you know yourself as a promoter like you know, guitar is still very strong and people want to see guitar music and people want to see country music and the authentic artists like you know Dwight Yoakam and John Mellencamp and stuff like that um they can still draw an audience you know massive following still so there's a bit of a myth there i mean sure a lot of these acts have massive massive stream uh streaming numbers but you know, not everyone's into streaming, you know, and we're probably a bigger band in reality than you would think we were if you just looked at the metrics of our, our band, you know, so. Well, especially because you guys have had a career globally, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's the other thing that's really interesting is that you did have this great domestic career and you continue to tour to this day, but you've got pockets around the world that you can go visit and still sell tickets. And, you know, that seems to be in in some ways a bit of an anomaly it's 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 happening i don't know as i say that though i go you know there we manage an artist brett kissel and 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 uh he's fairly big in the country space here in canada he's a nail artist of the year and entertainer of the year but he also mm-hmm. um has these pockets around the world of fan bases that we never even knew existed um, mm-hmm. other than the the reality that we get to see through analytics and, and, you know, some really strange ones, like is uh, one of his top 10 uh, nations in terms of consumption is Nigeria. And it's like, that's, how the that's hell did unusual. that happen? <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's not like we've ever been there, put in any work or even bought yeah. Instagram ads, but you know, for some reason there seems to be a pocket following and same, th- same with us. It's, it's fascinating to look at those numbers on Spotify and the yeah. breakdown. Um, we shot a video in Turkey, never played a show there, just a video. And we did some press, but 
it's like our number eight city in the world, Istanbul still. And <laughs> so, I mean, if we played there, we could probably do 2000 tickets, you know, based on the streaming numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just remarkable. And in Russia and different countries like that, that we've never visited, but, you know, just, you know, through word of mouth, people have found out about the band. So. So you must be pretty excited about dropping this new EP and, and just curious as well about seeing how it'll be received in this modern age. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wish the records came a little more fast and furious. Uh, I look at some of the bands in the 60s and they were putting out like four records over the course of two and a half years. And uh, uh, But for us, you know, you work on this music for so long and just to see the reaction that people have and the critiques, you know, legitimate critiques, you know, that's always fun to read some of the negative comments. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I mean, and hopefully, I mean, we have such a canon of songs now. We have I don't know, 140 recorded songs. So it's like, how do you get that down to 10 or 11 for the live show now? So if you know one of these new ones can make it into the live set, then you've probably written a good song. So, Without a doubt, especially with as much legacy as you guys have with, you know, over 30 years of history now as a band. Um, back to critiques, because that's an interesting one. Um, a lot of the audience who tunes in for this podcast, they're artists themselves and how have you learned to navigate and discern between um, malignant criticism and constructive criticism over the years? Well, I was just going to say that there's probably two categories. There's the guy in the basement that's just a troll and him getting negative feedback and a million replies is his wet dream. And then there's the lifelong fan that had expectations and you didn't quite meet their expectations. But that's a hard fan to please, though, because uh, we've all moved on. And you don't have a time machine to go back to when that fan was a naive listener and you were a naive performer and, you know, you wrote naive music <laughs> that was very good to everyone involved. But now things have moved on so much. So um, you, you've got to do it first and foremost for yourself. And if it's good enough for you, you can just only hope that there's enough people with a similar taste and try and keep your standards high and uh, don't put any crap out. Um, I mean, we have fallen victim, you know, I've never said this out loud, but, you know, I'll say it to you right now, just probably um, maybe trying to cater too much. Like, a, like I said, radio before in America would not play any of our world music stuff. Uh, in New York City, it was after 9-11. They're like, they were, we're not touching that stuff. They don't want to think, you know, that we're some sort of, a, you know, foreign radio station. You know, we're K-Rock, you know, we play the hits. So um, that's probably steered us away from writing some better you know world music songs um i mean another aspect of that too is the people that think we're you know appropriating you know uh uh opportunistically uh world music stuff when we have a different viewpoint we think we're exposing westerners to different stuff around the world and you know we that think is such a fucking crazy argument when i hear that from people it's like if you're not mocking it you're not appropriating it yeah you know if i eat mexican food just because i'm not mexican and i enjoy it it doesn't it's just as much homage as it is appropriation, you know? Yeah, no. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. And yeah. uh, it is a gray area and I understand it's full of nuance, you know, um, for sure. like banning yeah. the, the Indian or native American uh, head headdresses for uh, Coachella and stuff like that. You know, I, I can understand that it's a religious thing and, you know, it's not to be taken lightly and all that and a certain level of respect has to be paid there. But, you know, for me to pick up uh, a Kyoto from Japan and just riff out on it, why not? You know, come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. And and I do agree too with your your accurate assessment of the reality that part of this business is authentic artistic expression, and part of it is making sure that you can do that with an audience that seems to give a shit. You know, mm -hmm. so um, so there is even for even for the purest bands out there who have had any level of commercial success there's some pandering that almost has to go on inevitably mm -hmm. um yes just to complete our, our our final thought on the 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 world music thing though mm -hmm. i think of all this afro rock and the the guitarists in africa playing the fender stratocaster and the incredible reinvention of rock music when they interpret it with their background and just right. the idea that that would be stripped away because they're not being authentic to where the guitar was originated from. It's like, it's, it's just, it's like I said, there are nuances, but there should be some ground rules where there should be permission for people to respectfully, you know, um, 
uh, mix the cultures somewhat. So. Yeah, pay homage to a culture and to an aspect of culture that resonates with you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, again, I think intent matters a lot. Like, I love the fact that you use the word nuance because that feels to me like that's a word that we've lost. Yes, uh, in our Definitely. vocabulary these yeah. days. Yeah, Every, yeah. so many so self righteous. Binary. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Everything's so binary and black and white, and either you're this or you're that. And it's like, well, no, no. There's a lot of nuance in these things, and and so, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that it's, um, it's not to throw, or I was going to say, not to throw university students. It seems it happens a lot. First, second year of university, you thought something as a teenager, and then you get your mind blown by this different interpretation of things. And then you're dogmatic and, you know, self-righteous about this new way of thinking. And you don't realize that come your thirties, you'll probably evolve more and see a better worldview. And there's so many grays in the world and things aren't black and white. So. Yeah. And if you're, you know, I was having this discussion earlier with a friend of mine today, you know, if you're, if you're, um, let's say, for example, uh, summarizing an, an entire individual and all their experiences and everything that they've dealt with on the planet down to, you know, their gender and the color of their skin, then you're actually doing the same thing racists do, mm -hmm. you know, like you are using the same filters of judgment and applying them to someone uh you know in a very self-righteous manner that doesn't take into account all of the complexities of humanity and whatever it is that they've struggled with or dealt with or surmounted or overcome and and it's just again it's that like we talked about in the beginning connecting with your your empathy and your ability to forgive and and your humanity uh through those mechanisms to go all right, I don't see the world the same way. You, obviously, you have a different view of the world than I do, but you know we can still find some commonalities. We can still find some things that we agree on, but it's really hard to do that if one uh, member of that conversation believes that they're morally superior to the other, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's where it can get dangerous. And you know, I mean, we suffered that with the critics early on with the Led Zeppelin, with Jim Morrison singing, and you know, completely written off right away and. You know, some of the critics, like the Toronto Star critic, you know, we became friends in Toronto afterwards, and he didn't realize that I was from England. And I had all this appreciation and love and depth of uh, knowledge with, you know, punk music, new wave music. You know, uh, there's, there's, I know a lot about music, you know, and he knows a lot about music, too. It's his job to learn, know a lot about music and, you know, completely changed the dynamic of the relationship and how he saw the music, knowing that I knew that and I was making the kind of music I was making, you know. So it, it just, you know, once you learn the depths and the, the nuance, you know, it can change your way of thinking. So, yeah, once he was seeking to understand rather than just slap a label on you guys, his mm -hmm. uh, his entire experience around you and the band changed. Yeah. Well, There's very nothing... cool, man. I'm excited for this new record. Um, been a fan since back in the day and really excited to hear how you guys have evolved. All right. Great chatting with you. And uh, yeah, great, uh, great podcast and best of luck with everything. Thank you. I uh, I look forward to seeing you next time you're up here in the Okanagan. Let's make sure we connect. All right. Sounds good. Take care.